All right, welcome Barry Jenkins. Uh, I'm so excited to interview you. Uh, you've been on one of my lists um, to interview you because you've just done so much for our real estate industry of you know just contributing through you know social media, contributing through uh, one of the the vendors that I use for online lead generation by Lopo. Um, you know you have a great bunch of insight. Your book, this book right here, Too Nice for Sales, <laughs> is a fantastic book. Uh, so I want to plug you on that. Thanks, um, man. <laughs> and I had a pleasure of meeting you a couple of weeks ago at uh, the Glover U Conference in Orlando. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, we had we had a drink together. We we got into some conversations that that were pretty awesome. And just yeah. man, I just thought you're an interesting person. And so I wanted to invite you on on my YouTube channel that I'm building. And so welcome. I'm excited to interview Thank you. you. Thank you. No, man, pleasure's all mine. You know, what's cool about uh, coming across people that, you know, you ha we haven't met before, like you said, we know of each other via social and all the things we're in, but um, when you meet other people that are doing whatever it is they're doing, right? Like um, in my case, I got my stuff, but you also have your stuff that you're doing. So like, you, you know, your resume was quite impressive from my vantage point. So then we get together and we start, you know, coming up with ideas and, and that's what makes the world go round. So no, man, pleasure's all mine, but thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, um, you know, so Barry, I, I know you're you're a owner of a real estate brokerage and I think it's Better Homes and Gardens in Virginia Beach, uh, Virginia. Right. Um, yeah. Are you the broker as well? No, absolutely oh, okay. not. Okay, good. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, say that five more times. Uh -uh. <laughs> People like us don't want to do the paperwork. No, I just, I just, uh, I'm a visionary. Um, uh, my best use is not being the broker. Um, it's running a business. And so I'm, I'm actually, uh, kind of obsessive about that dividing and conquering. It's part of, I think, um, of how I've been able to accomplish some of the things I know what I'm good at. And I'm even more aware of, of the many things that I'm bad at. So I try to, Try to really stay focused there. That's fantastic. Good. Um, so one of the things you know that uh, intrigued me, and, and I was excited to meet you, was you know your book, Too Nice for Sales, uh, mm -hmm. and um, you know the, your your training with Wilopo and just the way you're thinking and how you're testing it, uh, testing the conversations via online and, and working with Raya and on the AI side of it and to convert online leads. Cause you know, everybody's generating online leads these days, that's not going yeah. away. But uh, the lead conversion piece is, yeah. I think you're probably one of the experts in the industry on online lead conversion. <laughs> man, so, man, that's heavy words. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, tell us a little bit about how and how, how you incorporate into your business and what you're testing now and, and where do you see this going um you know this year in 2023 with with a lot of the tech changes that are coming up yeah that's that's a great question you know i um i'm actually at inman right now i'll be speaking tomorrow on the department of justice um you know, them kind of examining buyer agent commission, what that looks like, the implications of the brokerage. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'm going to tell the group at Inman is that um, it is my opinion that um, the conversation, peace, communication with the prospect is more valuable now in light of the Department of Justice stuff going on than it was before, because, you um, the data is really clear. You know, part of uh, being amongst a creative group like at Wailopo, um, you know, we, we not only have ideas, but we test them at scale with millions of dollars in marketing. And what we found very clearly is the conversation is what the consumer's craving. Um, and to the degree that marketing companies and or salesmen or saleswomen can tap into whatever that conversation needs to look like from the consumer's vantage point, they're going to win and they're going to win at scale and they're going to win no matter what goes on around us. Because if I'm making the largest purchase of my life and I can talk to a human or a bot about my real estate need and I've got specific questions and I'm nervous, the chances of a bot being able to make me tangibly feel better. I'm not saying the agent needs to hold my hand and sing Kumbaya. I'm saying 
there's something about that human connection that the consumer is craving. We've watched as our the questions we ask leads from Wailopa's vantage point has uh, gone from three or four questions, which is the way it was for a decade for most marketing yeah. companies, to 25 questions. Yeah, And it's because the consumer's craving it, they're wanting it. Um, and you could say it's because of COVID or, or what have you, but yeah, that's that's what I've been really obsessed about. And it's been exciting. It's been an exciting, exciting social experiment. That's that's great. Now, now, what do you think this this chat GPT incorporates with you know the bots and online uh, lead conversion? Do you think that's a game changer for um, you know forever <laughs> you know, for that? I, I'm looking at it as as this could be a, a game changing piece. You know. What ChatGPT, in my opinion, does really well is it's able to take the question that we're asking it and operationalize it better than anything I've ever seen. I mean, you can say, can you teach me thermonuclear dynamics as if I was a fourth grader? And it's going to understand that. Whereas previously, it was all you know, okay, what's the topic of your blog? Enter here. Uh, you know, um, are there any websites you want to use as an influence? And so it was still, the output was still good, but you had to put way more in. And so because of the ease of access, I think it potentially will, I don't, I think it's just going to create more noise, to be honest with you. Okay, okay. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, like I just, think, I just think the more that people learn how to use it, it'll, it'll just be like, because, I mean, maybe one day it'll get really good, but generally speaking, you know, normally they're like, they might get like, they might, AI might nail like four paragraphs, but then they hit paragraph five and it's like, what, what does that have to do with anything? You know, they just like, and so I think there'll be a lot of noise. Um, and I think the need for authentic marketers and authentic communicators is going to grow. And um, the people that are going to be successful are just going to level up. It's what we have to do. You know? Right, right. So, so on a communication basis on, you know, we've, we've got viewership out there for real estate agents, they're generating the leads or their team is generating leads and some of the AI is working, the bots are working out there and um, the, the consumer out there doesn't know necessarily if you're the right agent that they want to speak with, right? And so right. we're trying to solve some of that through the bots to get some, some, um, uh, more intelligent responses to to guide the clientele down a pathway, right? Yeah. And what what do you think with the AI bots running, and an agent gets the lead, how should they respond, and and how should they react to some of the conversations that are coming through? Because a lot of a lot of leads will say, "Hey, I'm not ready to talk to an agent," or um, you know, just looking, or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with the way technology is right now, I think AI is a great leverage play for the agent. So if I'm doing something important over to the left and the lead comes in from the right, well, I can finish doing what is important and allow Raya or your AI texting to actually like not squander the opportunity and in many times get the opportunity to, to convert. Um, I, I don't think that AI is at the point where I can just say, okay, like I'll, I'll stop by at lunch and review all your conversations and see how you did. It's a great su a support to the agent. And, um, you know, I like some of the things so I had to write it's right around 1500 different conversations for Wailopo's AI. And um, right now she gets a response from Wailopo leads of about 51%. This isn't a commercial, it's just really interesting data. And of the 51% of the responses, that includes stop and I hate you and leave me alone, all that. Yeah. 13% um, uh, of the 51%, so 6% total, she ends up actually converting into an appointment. Okay, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so it's significant. But it's also under the heading of like a discussion about real estate. And so I was able to take, if any of these words come into play or this context, you know, this is the direction the lead conversation should go. And then AI is able to piece it together. Um, and, uh, you know, she's able to pick up on, you know, if there's a death in the family or, you know, she can express empathy and empathetic statements. And I think one of the reasons why our AI right now is working so well, and this is a change, this is since 2021, 
is the use of emojis. It's really hard to use emojis with a stranger and not be weird, you know? I mean, it's, it's right. hard. Like, And so where I landed with the emojis, uh, I talk about this because it sounds so stupid that we're talking seriously about emojis because it, it, it's interesting. But what I decided to do was if there's an emoji that represented the word that I just said, so if I say house, yeah, it doesn't feel as weird if you put a house emoji next to it. It's a little okay. weird, but it's not like super weird. Um, the edgiest one I did was putting an ear next to the word I'm listening. Um, <laughs> I pined over that for like three weeks, but finally we pushed it through and it worked great. So yeah, um, still need that human touch. You know, it's it's it's, it's still needed. It may, maybe one day it won't be, but right now it's still needed. It's still and so when you say that it, the human touch is that hyper hyper local of like hey by the way my favorite restaurant in this city is you know you know this pizza place or yeah. something like that is that something that an agent should be thinking about when they're trying to convert that lead or try to engage them more into a conversation well i think that because real estate is the most emotional and one of the largest financial transactions of someone's life i think that uh at many times the agent is an armchair therapist. Okay. And, um, you know, can Raya say, I'm so sorry for your loss? Yeah, she can pick up on that context and she can say that. But having a, a another human that can actually connect with you and like um, give you practical advice. So, you know, uh, another example, instead of saying the ice cream store, that would be a statement I would use to try to gain trust, right? Like if I could, if I could <coughs> inject that into the conversation that would be good and we are we are doing that with all the data we get when the lead submits the answers so if, if the lead says they want a swimming pool for example what we're working on now is having that answer work its way into the script later on in the conversation that's already in you know in production and, and everything like that but we also have a song and dance with ai and the government specifically twilio you know th these these th cell phone verizon at&t t-mobile sprint all of them have changed how text messaging is being handled. And so you've got this tension from the government to function a certain way. And then you have business owners like us who want AI to work a certain way. And there's this song and dance that we have to play with, with the powers that be to allow certain words and phrases and cadences. And you have to have a certain number of people responding or they'll, they'll, that you won't even know your texts aren't going through. They just turn them off. Yeah. Really? It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's crazy out there, man. Um, they're really cutting down on it. Okay, wow. I, I didn't even know that. I, I mean, yeah. I've, I figure some of that stuff's going to spam and stuff, but I didn't realize that. I thought that was the, the um, you know, the mobile phone companies, not necessarily the government coming in there and trying to put regulation in there. Well, it's the TCPA, you know, the consent. And so, yeah. you know, there's just a lot of, it's kind of like RESPA. Everybody's scared of RESPA, but nobody knows what RESPA really means. That's how it feels here. You know what I'm talking about? Like everything, yeah. ooh, RESPA. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, kind of. It's like, oh, TCPA, consent laws. What do you, why are you saying that? And so nobody really knows. We all just know we don't want to get in trouble. So we're just right. trying the best we can. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, um, you know, give us some examples of what a, what a buyer's agent on a team can do, knowing that Raya is working, and you know they they should be doing lead follow up. But you know, most of the agents out there they're following up two or three times and and yeah. hoping they'll say something intelligent to get a response back, right? Sure. Um, sure. So, is there a number of how many times that they need to be responding? Is is there a, a another system that an agent can implement by their own efforts, along mm -hmm. with AI, that can really produce a better result of communication and response from a, an internet lead? Yeah, I can actually give you two uh, really easily executable methods to generate business all based off of the premise that you have some kind of marketing taking place that's keeping the consumer on your website. So in my world, in your world, Brent, it's Ylopo and <coughs> Ylopo remarketing. We know that they're coming back. So I'm right. gonna depend on that technology to keep them on my website. And then I'm gonna use my CRM to divide and conquer certain behaviors. My first and favorite one to do is to look for all old leads that nobody's ever spoken to. 
that could be a couple of different filters depending on your CRM, but old, unconverted, recently active. So I like to see them on my website recently. That could mean something different for all of us. And, <laughs> and then um, if I can add like a behavior of some kind, maybe saving homes or sharing homes, any way to add it. So then what I've got is a bunch of old leads that are still active, that were never converted, that at one point in time did something important on my website and just call all of them. Yeah. And just just do a, uh, like a, almost like an admin or a transaction coordinator vibe and just two, two main ways of doing it. So uh, go through and just very basic, I'm cleaning up my system, I got to your name, and I was going to clean, you know, archive your file because you've been in it forever, in our system forever. Um, but I didn't see in the notes if you ever actually found a home. So I figured I'd call. That's it. Perfect. The reason why it works so well is it's someone that's been active and is still active. That's why it works so well. And you're, you're basically doing a temperature check. But the vibe is serendipitous. They're going to, about a third of the people for us that answer the phone in that scenario end up saying they're still looking and we set an appointment. So that's my first favorite, super easy, actionable, like immediately. Um, and then uh, the other one I like is, um, we've had a lot of people in our industry that fizzled out, you know, buyers that, not, not agents necessarily, but buyers and sellers that started on the process and for one reason or another said, oh, I think I'm gonna wait. I think we call all those people, text all those people and say, hey, hope you're well, been a while. There's been a, a subtle shift subtle shift in the market and um, there's an opportunity for some um, to revisit the, their home buying and home selling dreams um, based on your circumstances. If you have five minutes, I'd love to chat. Something like that, subtle shift, opportunity has arisen, love to chat for five minutes. What, <coughs> and of course what the opportunity is, there are people that wanted to buy, they could buy, but they didn't have the cash. Well, there are certain neighborhoods and scenarios where you might not need as much cash because the seller might be more willing to give cash. Um, and that's market specific. I realize that's not gonna work for everybody, but for us, that's worked really well. We did, we had an initiative where I had all my agents do that over five days. Okay. Everybody got clients off of it, out of their old dead leads. Everybody did. That's great. Yeah. Now, now, do you think that seller leads Okay, we generate seller leads and um, you know, I find that a lot of them are not ready to go today, right? Right. They're, they're kind of sometime in the future, it could be six months, eight months, you know, a year out. They're just gathering information, right? They're curious yeah. about real estate. And what, what's the best method that you found to convert seller leads? Well, I think first, uh, and I talk about this in the book, um, sellers don't like talking about selling. Um, it's actually very stressful and it's like the antithesis of what they're excited about. So my favorite seller lead is someone that wants to buy a home. Yeah. Move. Right. And, um, talk to them about where they're going and then have a subtle bridge between what they're excited about and what they need to do. The way that I like to broach the subject is I just like to ask, do you intend on using any of the equity from the sale of your home as a down payment for your purchase? I'm still talking about purchasing. Okay. So I haven't like ruined the mood yet, right? Perfect. Like they're still they're still kind of like, oh yeah, uh, yeah, actually, uh, you know, I, I would like to do that. Okay, well, if you're like most of my clients, the thought of listing and buying, it's super overwhelming. I want you to know that there's a very strict process we follow. We're gonna make it super smooth for you. All I need is about 20 or 30 minutes in your home. And we'll just plan out what the next year looks like for you. If you get in their house, it's game over. Cause you yeah. know, you're gonna do your CMA. They met you, they know you're not weird, that you're, you know, you were, you know what you're talking about. Um, and uh, you know, you probably saved them a little bit of money. They were gonna add granite or marble countertops and now they know they won't get any money from it because of your advice. It's just like a really easy way to segue into it. So my favorite is a buyer lead that has a home to sell. I focus on what they're buying because that's how they came to me. They didn't come to me searching home, what's my home worth, which by the way, I don't know anybody that owns a house that isn't interested in what their home is worth. So that's why I really, I'm, I've never really been a big fan of home value leads because I care what my homes are worth. Like I look at it. Don't do you look at it? I mean, I do. 
Yeah, I look at it. I look at it. Yeah, I had a conversation yesterday uh, about it. Yeah, I'm not selling. I'm. They are good. Like I'm putting them all in a trust, so my family will have wealth for the rest of their lives. I'm not selling any, but I still check what they're worth. Right. So that's why finding you know because you looking into the motivation of buying, you know it uh it makes it a lot of fun. And this was actually a project at Wailopo I had to work on. I had to figure out how to get inside the head of homeowners. So, because yeah. that's what my local customers want, and that's kind of where I landed. Right. So, what type of what type of training are you doing for your agents on on your team or at your brokerage to get better at the conversations that they're having with buyers and sellers? That's a really good question. So, one, we have four questions we want them to ask, and that doesn't sound profound at all, but these questions are designed to open up opportunities. Um, so I'll give you a, an example. And I, I, this is one of the ones in the book, so it's not new, but uh, instead of saying, what kind of home do you want and expecting the lead to have clarity? I say, I'm sure you're not ready, but tell me more about what you want to change about where you live. Perfect. Love that question. Uh, new certainty. Their certainty is what they don't want where they live. They, and they can speak authoritatively. The difference between asking the first question of what kind of home do you want and the question I asked, if I ask them what kind of home they want, instantly it's like, I'm not ready for this. I, I don't know what I want yet. That's, I'll call you when I figure it out. And right. I've highlighted the fact that they're not ready to talk to me. Whereas by going to a place where they can speak comfortably about it, not only am I giving them confidence, but I'm leading them down the path of self-discovery of what their wants and wishes are. And and so it's the Socratic method of, of teaching, of selling. Socrates used questions to teach yeah. his students. Jesus did the same thing. Like, it's not like a one and done thing. It's, it's a very, because I think of the way that it it, it, it causes the, the person trying to answer the question to think and uh, makes you learn a little bit more. So, um, so yeah, those, that's kind of where I'm at with that. That's great. Great insight. I love Thanks. that. So, um, you know what? So the rest of this year, how does that play out for, you know, the interest rates, you know, where do you think those are going? Um, do you think that the home buyer, obviously there's going to be a little bit less home buying, buying going on is what, you know, everybody's telling me all the experts out there. Um, yeah. what are you seeing? What do you anticipate for, for the rest of the year? You know, um, I think the feds are going to raise the rates a little bit more. I don't think they're done. Um, I think we're all seeing positive signs in the economy, not like cause for rejoicing, but yeah. it's not continuing to bottom out like in 2000, like it, you know, we're, we're starting to see like a lift. And one interesting factoid, uh, I actually heard this at Inman that I, it's the builder's confidence index, I think is what it's called. Okay. It's been negative for like 10 years and just recently it's positive. And that number is based off of the builders saying, I, this is what I think is about to happen. So I'm going to buy wood and nails and like they're putting their money, they're preparing for, for rain basically. Uh, okay. um, and, and that, that's an encouraging number for me because new construction has been a problem, uh, especially the last since COVID and all that stuff happened. Absolutely. Okay, so that's encouraging. That's, there's yeah. encouraging signs out there. Yeah, a little great bit. Great news, everybody. <laughs> no, no, not great news yet. It's just, you know, I think we might be, the, the leak is slowing in the boat. Yeah, so yeah. We're not we're not taking on as much water. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's there's plenty of opportunity out there. Oh, uh, yeah. I, you know, I see, I see some great opportunities in all kinds of different markets. And I'm personally looking for the deals to buy. But, you know, my criteria is I want it to cash flow or I want it to have some tremendous upside and I'm willing to keep that property for 10 years. Right. So oh, that's sure. my personal criteria is right, right. if it works in those those realms, I'm a buyer. Right. Um, if it's something that I think that, you know, I'm not going to want, I'm just not not going to buy it. So I, I quit flipping and and uh, it would have to be a smoking deal if, if um, yeah. I was going to flip in this market. But uh, yeah, I'm not. Holds, I'm, I'm yeah. all for long-term holds. Long-term holds, I've got it down to a science. Um, flips, too much emotion for me. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not into it. Yeah. Um, but um, something I was going to say, in the beginning of my book, I actually talk about how um, I lost everything in 2008, like the market yeah. crash. And um, the, the thing that I learned during that time is I waited for everything to go back to whatever normal was when the market crashed. 
and I starved that first year. I racked up, this is 2008 money, but it was like $60,000 just getting groceries and trying to make me make my bills. And um, so anyway, I won't go through the whole story, but when uh, COVID hit, I remember the first week that we weren't allowed to hold open houses and real estate in our area had changed at that moment. And I, I literally, I could tell you where I was and I had to do a webinar, it was Lopo's largest webinar we've ever done to give, it was like a state of the union to give direction. So it's this week of leadership and of having to give direction to a lot of people that are wondering what to do. And I said, hey, in 2008, I sat on my hands and waited for everything to go back to normal and it never did. So I don't know what next month or next year looks like, but I can tell you that this week, this is how we're gonna sell homes this week. It's not gonna look the same next week or the week after that, but I, this time around, I'm not waiting. We're, we're just gonna, we're gonna take what we got. And so that's why I know I don't care what's going on around in the world around me. I'm going to figure it out. And so I wanna encourage the listeners that even with up, down, around, circles, you know, all the different things that we're experiencing, you have the ability to set yourself apart and reinvent yourself every day. So just do that. Yeah, that's great, brilliant advice. Yeah, thanks, thanks man. for that.